Welcome to the Andrea Mitchell Center for the Study of Democracy. My name is Miranda Sklaroff, and I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Political Science at Penn. I'm excited to be here with Professor Thea Ria Francos discussing her work on the politics of extraction in this event, Remapping Climate Justice, Lithium Extractivism, and Going Green in the Global North. She's an Associate Professor of Political Science at Providence College, an Andrew Carnegie Fellow from 2020 to 2022, and a member of the Climate and Community Project. Rio Francos's work um, had primarily dealt with extraction in Latin America, although her recent work has expanded to cover extractivism worldwide. Her first book, Resource Radicals from Petro Nationalism to Post Extractivism in Ecuador, looked at the politicization of anti extractivism among radical groups and focused on oil and mining. Her most recent work, which has been featured in global environmental politics and foreign policy, among others, um, looks at a broad I'm sorry, uh, looks at a broad range of issues related to lithium extraction, from the promise of lithium batteries in the global north when countries create policies for going green to the adverse effect environmental outcomes of lithium extraction. Rio Francos takes on a larger lens in her work from uh, to show what the consequences of these green policies actually are. Lithium extraction takes place around the world, including Australia, Chile, China, Argentina, and the United States, problematizing frameworks that only look at one or the other region as the subject for climate justice. The broad global network of lithium extraction shows how embedded the practice is, but also gives rise to new forms of resistance and solidarity. We will have a slightly shorter program today um, than previous events in the series. I'll ask Professor Ria Francos um, some questions for about 45 minutes or so, and then we will move to a Q&A for the last 10 to 15 minutes. Please ask your questions whenever you think of them, and we will hold them in the queue until the end. Welcome, and thank you for joining us, Professor Ria Francos. I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. I'm excited too. Um, so I'm just going to start off with a really basic question about your research, which is what brought you to extractivism as sort of the, the political problem that you focus on throughout the span of your um, academic work? Thanks for that question. Um, so with even just the concept of extractivism as this kind of interconnected global system of rapacious extraction, um, I'm really indebted to Latin American scholars and intellectuals and social movement leaders who really I think coined that that term, that concept, and kind of a broader theory of it, as well as a kind of theory of change or resistance to it, right? And I first encountered that uh, in my own work, um, um, actually before I was an academic, when I was uh, uh, living in Ecuador in 2008, before I went to grad school at, at the University of Pennsylvania, I was living in Ecuador and a recently elected uh, um, leftist administration had just taken power. And I was in Ecuador in part to kind of observe another site of what's called the Pink Tide, which was a bunch of left-wing and progressive governments that are, were elected across Latin America, starting with Hugo Chavez in 1999. And I was there to kind of look what it looked like on the ground to see Rafael Correa, the then president of Ecuador, um, try to govern from the left, but also to look at what social movements thought of this new landscape of having a left-wing president. Um, and what I learned very quickly upon arrival was that resource extraction was a really contentious issue and particularly contentious in a way that actually divided the left, right? And so you had a kind of interesting circumstance of a left-wing government in power and a bunch of left-wing movements who had kind of enabled the rise of that government, but that were um, in increasing polarization over the interrelated issues of resource extraction, environmental injustice, and indigenous sovereignty, right? And so that kind of piqued my interest. Um, it, it, it felt to me that because extraction seemed like such a thorny and fraught issue for the left, that that merited sort of further investigation. And I kind of went with that and eventually wrote a dissertation and a book. And in various ways, I think my work kind of grapples with what is so challenging about extraction? Why does extraction feel difficult to have kind of progressive policies around? Why does it cause divisions among folks that otherwise might agree on other issues, right? And so I take that from the kind of pink tide of Latin America unfolding during a commodity boom and a lot of intensified extraction. So that's part of also what made it so salient then all the way to the present with my work on the supply chains for green technologies where we see a kind of different angle on extraction being conflictual, which is uh, the seeming contradiction. We're gonna we're gonna kind of unpack it a little bit maybe throughout this talk. But um, between rapid climate policies, which involve 
lots of new technologies to harness renewable energy on the one hand, and the fact that those supply chains begin with mining and create environmental harm, right? So this feels intractable um, in a way that sort of reminds me of, of the intractability or seeming intractability of those debates in Ecuador and elsewhere in Latin America. Um, and so so that that's what's kind of, I guess, continued my interest in it. But and and we can maybe delve more into what the different positions are um, around the debate uh, around energy transition minerals um, and what maybe some ways to mitigate, though probably not eliminate some of those tensions uh, might be. OK, great. Um, I think let's let's turn um, to your uh, your newer work, which focuses on lithium. And, you know, I think even someone, you know, with a passing um, knowledge of, of, of newer green policies probably knows that lithium is sort of important for them. And so lithium is this ir irreplaceable resource for elect uh, electric vehicle batteries. And in the U United States, at least, um, electric vehicles are sort of touted as the climate resolution, the solution to climate change. Um, there are all of these new policies that um, really incentivize buying them. You get tax rebates in states and a bunch of other things. Um, but, uh, you know, lithium extraction is also a process that causes environmental degradation, among other things. And so first, can you talk a little bit about what uh, um, lithium extraction is like? I learned from reading your work was how, you know, I think about mining coal as sort of, you know, the model for what, uh, what a sort of... Um, extractivist practice looks like so that's bad for the environment, but lithium actually is a much different process of extract of extraction and, and, a, and a varied process of extraction, it seems. So could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, so um, yeah, just to maybe reiterate a little of what you said and expand on it about what lithium even is and why we're talking about it, and then I'll kind of get into some of the impacts of its, of its extraction. Um, so lithium is uh, right now an essential ingredient in lithium ion batteries. So not surprising that they're called that, I guess. Um, and I say for right now, because obviously technological substitution may happen over time, right? And I don't wanna say that the only battery technology ever will be lithium ion, but it is It is for now. And you know, roughly speaking, uh, we have lithium ion batteries in our cell phones and in our laptops, but they are also the batteries that power or store energy more properly said. Uh, in electric vehicles, but also in electric bikes, electric buses, right? So any electric mobility needs a battery form of storage. Um, and, you know, it's extremely important, and, and maybe we'll also have a chance to expand on this at some point, to, to cut emissions from our transportation sector, right? So nothing I say is to downplay that. I'm extremely in favor of cutting emissions from all sectors of the US economy and the global economy. And the reason why transportation is particularly at issue in the US is that we have a very polluting transportation sector, right? In the US, 30% of our emissions come from transportation. And that's about double the global kind of average, right? Globally, 15% of emissions come from, from transportation. So we know we need to tackle the sector it's also the only sector where emissions are still rising, right? So it's like very urgent to eliminate emissions from transportation. Um, there are a whole bunch of different ways to design a transportation sector to achieve that end. We'll get into that a little bit later, perhaps. But as you said, right now, the primary approach is to focus on individuals changing out their traditional ICE internal combustion engine vehicles for vehicles with lithium batteries in them. And so then the question kind of arises as to what what are the supply chains that furnish those batteries? And what are some of the social and environmental impacts that we should be thinking about as these supply chains are being built around the world? Um, and I specifically focus on, on the impacts of lithium mining. And you know, lithium is a kind of weird and interesting element in the periodic table. Um, it's very reactive. Uh, you don't find it as a pure metal in nature. So it's always kind of part of other chemical compounds. And what that means is kind of, as you suggested, there is a wide range of lithium deposits that are radically different from one another. So, you know, just to take two examples, um, lithium can exist in brine, which is how I encountered it in Chile. And also the one operating lithium mine in the US is also a brine operation. So what that looks like is an enormous salt flat in a high altitude mountainous region underneath the crusty salt flat, there are 
uh, naturally occurring wells of, uh, of briny water, of salty water that has lithium in it, right? And so the, that's sucked to the, the, the surface with pumping, and then it's arrayed in these enormous evaporation ponds. And a lot of the mining is actually the evaporation of water. So that's what concentrates it, right? So that's a kind of unusual, not the first type of thing that when we think of like an image of mining. But lithium can also take more like kind of recognizable or traditional forms of, of hard rock deposits, right? And then there's also clay deposits and geothermal. And so, you know, this is just to say that each of these involve their own impacts. Um, I'll just speak to, to Chile, which is a place that I've done the most research for, for this book project. Um, that's where lithium is extracted in the oldest and also driest desert on earth, the Atacama Desert, which is in the north of Chile. And through that, that brine process that I mentioned of extraction and evaporation of brine. And, you know, one thing to just note is I said it's the driest desert on earth, right? So water vulnerability is already an issue. The water balance is naturally negative, but of course, human activities can make that worse. And lithium mining is occurring in this region where there's also massive copper production, which is also very water intensive. So you have a kind of exacerbation of various extractive harms at once. And what you know, what's at issue specifically with lithium is that although brine is salty water and humans don't directly drink salt water, um, it, it is interconnected in the broader hydrological system that's underneath the ground in the desert, right? So you have freshwater aquifers and you have brine aquifers, and I won't get too technical, but they interface. And so there's a lot of scientific concern around whether removing these vast quantities of brine actually makes the fresh water go further underground or is harder to access. Um, and there have been lots of concerns among indigenous communities living in the area that that is in fact happening. Um, another thing to note is that we've seen some biodiversity impacts, right? So this area, um, often people think of deserts as like there's no life there, which is totally not what a desert is. A desert is just an extreme environment and can be actually a really striking environment in terms of biodiversity. And so one of the wonderful species that calls the Atacama Desert home and specifically like migrates on those salt flats are these beautiful endemic flamingo species. And we've seen some reduction in their populations near lithium mines, right? And so that's also a, um, a concern. Um, and I guess I'll just throw in there, though, it may not be the top thing that we think about when we think about um, what types of environmental concerns humans tend to have, but um, there are also species that live in the brine. So the brine is itself a habitat of all of these microorganisms that scientists are just actually beginning to understand how they're connected to the broader kind of web of life and also what the scientific and even technological or pharmaceutical value of some of these microorganisms might be. But right now they're just being kind of sucked up in the process of, of brine extraction. Um, but just to maybe say this a little bit more generally, you know, what you have in the Atacama Desert is a place where there, um, for millennia, indigenous communities have lived. They have likewise been uh, oppressed and repressed by first colonization and then by the Chilean state. They encounter a variety of different extractive industries that are harming the landscape and making their livelihoods more challenging. Um, and two of these minerals that I'm speaking about right now, copper and lithium, are needed for the energy transition, which immediately kind of sets up this this kind of intersection where a place that, you know, all of those harms have occurred that I just mentioned, and is also extremely vulnerable to climate change, as all desert places are, they're getting drier and hotter, um, is also the site of extraction for technologies that are needed to mitigate climate change, right? And so that that kind of tension is very visible at the Atacama and you can, in the Atacama desert, and it kind of reveals how communities are increasingly on the front lines of like multiple crises, right? They're on the front lines of the climate crisis and on the front lines of the expansion of extraction to provide these minerals. Um, one last brief thing I'll say, and then I'll, I'll turn it back to you, um, is that, you know, the other thing to kind of keep in mind when we think about impacts of mining is that these impacts will grow as the scale increases, right? And so every forecasting agency out there has said that lithium uh, production will dramatically expand over the next 5, 10, 15 years, right? So when we think about what impacts are now, we also kind of have to think towards the future and how those impacts might be exacerbated as, um, as mining kind of ramps up and expands territorially. 
Um, okay, great. Thank you. There's so many different directions we can go in, but I think I'm going to keep us on lithium and then we're going to maybe talk about some of the um, sort of community responses and resistances to um, extraction um, uh, more generally um, throughout uh, Latin America and the world. Um, but to, to keep us on lithium, so, you know, um, and you gestured towards this by saying, you know, the sort of default is that every, you know, that you know the sort of idea is that everyone just replaces their their you know old combustion engine with a brand new car with a lithium battery and that will sort of mitigate climate change and there are all of these sort of problems with it and so specifically with the um, climate and community project you've come up with a um, collection of recommendations for limiting lithium use um, and um, policies that sort of are generally um, you know uh, for reducing lithium, but also with maybe introducing a sort of more uh, a, a, a framework that might take into account some of these supply chain issues. Um, so could you talk a little bit more about those um, policies for, um, you know, exactly how much the 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 use of lithium batteries is problematized by the, these kinds of things and and what some policies are that you have um, have sort of recommended or, or thought through it as, as possible mitigation for this? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So maybe I'll kind of zoom out and explain the origins of this report and modeling exercise that you just referenced. Um, so I work with a think tank called Climate and Community Project, and we put out this, this model and accompanying qualitative research on like what are the sort of the different options for moving forward to get to a zero emissions transportation sector that, as you said, take into account the supply chain concerns, which are environmental and social, but also geopolitical and economic, right? We haven't gotten into that yet, but there are other reasons to not want to ramp up a lot of mining because we know it's a site of geopolitical tension and also is a factor in making these end use technologies more costly, right? So um, that that all, all aside, um, years ago, when I first started this project, where I went to Chile in January of 2019 uh, as my first kind of research site, and as I began to learn about the, the harms of lithium mining and also the, the social contention around it, I, I sort of tried to think about how that sits with the fact that I'm also a renewable energy advocate and like someone that believes deeply in climate justice and wants climate action to be very urgent, right? So that felt like a kind of tension for me. And I was kind of thinking through like, I wonder if there are different pathways to get to, in this case, a zero emissions transportation sector uh, that don't involve as much mining as some of the most alarming uh, kind of predictions, right? And so just to mention one of those, the International Energy Agency, which does a lot of this kind of forecasting, says that we'll need 40 times as much lithium um, based on 2020 demand uh, to serve 2040 um, kind of demand, right? And so that's a an very fast uh, and, and large increase of an extractive sector. And so I began to think like someone must have done a comparative analysis where we look at different ways to transition the transportation sector to zero emissions and how much lithium or copper or cobalt or nickel, right? We could do this with any of the battery minerals or different minerals involved in electric vehicles or charging stations. But what I found is that no one had actually asked that question, which I think actually speaks a lot about how much car dependency uh, is kind of deep, deeply sedimented in, in our kind of political imagination and even constrains what critical climate scientists and social scientists, what kind of questions they ask, right? Anyway, I won't go through the whole research project process, but just to take us to like the end result, what we found is that the design of our transportation system and policies, and also things like land use policy and recycling policies, all of these have a huge impact on how much lithium would be needed. And I think we can kind of generalize um, because all of the things that would reduce lithium would also likely reduce some of the other battery materials and other extracted materials, right? So this is, I think, a broader intervention than just lithium. But just to kind of give you a snapshot, um, the things that we looked at are, you know, how much are Americans in individual electric vehicles versus taking an electric bus or versus riding a bike or walking, right? How much do Americans live in really sprawled uh, suburbs and exurbs where the distances are very long and it's hard to get around without a car versus living in a more dense environment, right? Like how much do we recycle batteries and recover the materials from them? 
Um, and the last thing we looked at, which is actually very salient uh, right now, is like how large are these batteries? And, and even if we just look at cars, there's a big difference between the recently discontinued, unfortunately, Chevrolet Bolt, which was like a small, compact electric vehicle that Chevy just decided not to create anymore. Um, and like the e-Hummer, which is an enormous gargantuan vehicle with an, you know, many, like hugely like thousands of pound battery, right? So even within cars, there's a big range of how big the batteries are, which then affects how much materials they need. And so this is all to say that um, we found that if we go to the year 2050, which was the, the last year that we modeled, the difference between the worst case scenario, which is ever bigger batteries, more ESUVs, um, more car dependency, the same amount of sprawl, et cetera, like nothing gets better basically, but we do electrify everything. So we do get to zero emissions, which is important, but all these other practices remain the same between that worst case scenario and a best case scenario of more mass transit use, more walkable and bikeable cities, more density in our land use planning, more recycling, and also smaller batteries for our cars, there's a 92% difference in the lithium volumes required to furnish the US market, right? So it's a dramatic change. And you know maybe the best case scenario is utopian or not politically feasible in all of its elements in this moment, but it's still useful to have as a kind of horizon to think like, what the optimum approach to, to transportation policy would be. And just to add one, one quick addition to that um, and maybe bring it a little full, full circle to your question, um, you know, th this outcome is also helpful to kind of mitigate, again, I don't want to say eliminate, but to, to loosen or soften the tension between urgent climate action and, um, and the impacts of, of extraction and supply chains, right? And the reason I say that is because there's a lot of other research that shows that we get to our climate targets faster if we get Americans or whatever the country in question is like out of cars, right? As soon as you get someone out of a car and into a bus, even if it's a traditional bus, not an elect electric bus, you radically reduce emissions footprints, right? And the total emission picture. And so, you know, there's actually not a reason that we have to think that climate action and protecting landscapes from extraction are at such odds. I think they're more zero sum, the more resource intensive and like individually unequal and consumerist our kind of approach to these policies is. But if we can think holistically about the sector and try to bring our car sizes more in line with global averages or get folks into other modes of transportation, we'll actually make faster progress on climate while also reducing how much mining is net necessary to, to kind of build this new supply chain. Um, wow, yeah, the I guess I read the 92% reduction in lithium um, between the two different models, but it didn't click until you said that's like a huge, huge, huge amount. Um, okay, great. So, you know, I think that um, one of the things that your newest work is really looking at is on the onshoring of like lithium extraction in the global north. And so you've just been sort of talking about how, in the, you know, maybe a huge part of this project is um, getting people in the, particularly the United States, but may, and other countries like in the global north out of their, like out of their cars period and onto public transportation and, um, you know, or the sidewalks. Um, but I'm wondering how that changes the politics of extraction sort of more broadly when it's, um, when we might start to see uh, extractivism, I mean, we already do see extractivism, but not of lithium um, effects and, and, and sort of like move to the global north, how that changes the sort of like orientation of politics as you discuss it. Um, maybe the answer is not very much, but maybe it, it, it's, it's actually seems like quite a different kind of account when we, when we think about, um, when we think about the, the sort of new onshoring. So maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Sure. Um, and and yeah, I'll, I'll add a little context so that this it, it's clear how this is a little bit of a counterintuitive development, right? That not one that I expected. Um, I went to Chile to research lithium initially because I'm sort of used to analyzing resource extraction in a Latin American context. And Latin America is a huge producer of a lot of industrial and also more specialty metals that are used um, in the global economy. Um, and, and Latin America is kind of indicative of a broader pattern where, you know, research continually shows that the, the, there's a net flow of material resources from the global south to the global north, right? That 
a fancy way to term that that I do find useful is unequal ecological exchange, where you have a kind of resource drain from the global south and also a monetary drain because the global north on the whole also benefits monetarily from those trade flows and surpluses, right? And so this is a pattern established in colonialism, but that is actually still very much with us. Um, and, and it applies not just to extracted materials, but to the embodied land, labor, and energy and traded goods, right? So you have kind of a net south to north flow of resources. Um, that still is the case, right? Um, so what I'm saying does not change that. And I don't think any policies in the near term are going to radically change that. But there is a kind of mutation or shift happening that I also think is important to attend to. That basic scenario, we might call it like offshoring extractive harm or something like that. And there are exceptions, uh, um, as you mentioned, Miranda, like, and you mentioned coal before, like, of course, the US is a major, is the world top actually gas and oil producer, right? So it's not like extraction is new to the US, but for, for decades, both the US and Europe have increasingly relied on imports of metals, right? They have not done a lot of domestic mining and they have procured those minerals from mainly the global South, Africa and Latin America, with some countries like Canada and Australia also in the mix as main, major mining uh, producers. Um, and policymakers and economic elites and whoever were basically satisfied with that, right? It offshores some of the most harmful parts of supply chains, therefore kind of uh, pushing the conflict and, and harm that they cause like into other people's uh, uh, jurisdictions. And also mining, because it's at the very beginning of the supply chain, is not the most economically valuable part of the process, right? So the global north kind of hoards the kind of tech and R&D and those kinds of pieces of the supply chain and then was happy to just import uh, the raw materials from elsewhere. But I won't kind of take us through the whole genealogy, and this, this is in my global uh, environmental politics article that you mentioned, but... But in recent years, and very much picking up steam during the pandemic, and also in a response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the ways that that has also affected global supply chains, there's been a lot more concern about supply chains. And I think that that's obvious or probably a uh, familiar thought to many folks in the room. Um, and this started again with the pandemic, but has really accelerated uh, even since then. And in this context, I see policymakers in the European Union and the US government increasingly aligning over this desire to onshore supply chains, including their extractive nodes, not just the higher tech or higher value added pieces. Um, in the interest of what they will say is like national security often or the security of supply chains. In the US particularly, there's a lot of reference to tensions with China or US policymakers desire to kind of um, beat China in this kind of race to, to dominance of supply chains. Um, and there's also sometimes, and I'm not sure how much stock to put in these, but I'll just mention them, the European Union and, and U.S. officials will often sometimes say, like, it's also more responsible and ethical and better for human rights and environment to mine the stuff at home where the regulations are supposedly better, right? So this is an interesting twist, right? Instead of everything being imported, we're seeing increasing mining projects around the US and European Union. And just to give an example, in the Western United States, there are now over 100 lithium projects that have been proposed. I'm not, they're not gonna all happen because that's not how mining works, but a subset of them will happen. And there are several like, you know, sort of marquee projects that have gotten major investments from the US government and also from downstream corporations um, in the auto industry. So there's a lot of action happening uh, on the lithium front in the US and Europe. And similarly, I visited Spain and Portugal, which is another uh, uh, global north kind of area that a lot of lithium mining projects are being proposed. And the question is like, is this global justice, right? Because I said at the beginning of my response to your question that the kind of status, status quo ante and the continued status quo is that there's a lot of inequality in where resources come from, who benefits from them, and who pays the social and environmental costs from them of them. Um, and it would seem maybe that onshoring lithium to the global north is like a way to redress that, right? Because instead of just offshoring harms and like importing the benefits, you are actually, you know, it's in our backyard, so to speak, to use that metaphor. Um, and I think that, you know, I want to honor one kernel of truth in that, which is I do think that the map of extraction is very unequal. And I do think from a global justice perspective, we should think seriously 
about what more a more just map might look like, at least in terms of like the economic and environmental kind of costs and benefits. Um, and so I think that's a good impulse. What, you know, I'm not sure though, that when you dig into the details that the precise way that onshoring is happening does anything to redress harm in the global South. And one of the main reasons I say this, and this kind of brings me to the, the end of your question, is that the communities that are facing the threat of lithium or copper or rare earths projects in the global north um, are actually quite marginalized communities, right? They are not, it's not like the owner of the Tesla or like the shareholder in a mining company is the one with the mine in their backyard, right? It's folks in indigenous communities, um, in underserved rural areas, right? Place people that have experienced ethnic and economic discrimination and exploitation, right? Um, it's countries in the kind of semi-periphery of Europe where there have been, you know, a, lots of issues with um, people not having basic needs met or austerity, right? So it, it, there's not, it's not really the case that lithium mining uh, is bringing kind of, or the uh, that onshoring is kind of more equitably distributing the harms. It's sort of just more targeting populations that are already marginalized within the global north. Um, that being said, I think that fact opens up some interesting opportunities for international solidarity that are already happening in real time, right? So this is not just like an idea I have. This is what I'm observing kind of in the world, which is that I'm seeing a lot of interesting alliances and coalitions and conversations happening across the kind of global north-south divide, right? And, you know, while I think that it's really useful to think of the world in terms of global north and south, again, as a kind of legacy of, of colonialism and neocolonialism, that, that framing also hides a lot of internal inequalities, right, within those, you know, broadly speaking, two kind of regions of the world. Um, and what I've seen happen is, for example, indigenous communities in Nevada, um, uh, you know, in on calls or in events with indigenous communities in Chile, actually finding that they might have more in common in terms of their historical experiences or the threats that they're facing in the near term than these like vast geographic distances might might suggest or then the fact that like one of them's in a global south country and the other is like in the belly of the beast right and so you know that kind of international solidarity um i think is is kind of expanding in an interesting way in in kind of in parallel to the expansion and geographic shifting of these supply chains themselves. Um, I don't wanna overstate it because always anti-extractive resistance is difficult. It's difficult to cross you know, great distances in your alliances, but, um, but I definitely see this happening. And, and I think again, it, it speaks to the fact that like, in a lot of ways, like wherever extraction goes, like there's not always resistance, but you do at least set up the possibility for conflict. And I do, do see communities in very different corners of the world confronting what they see as kind of shared grievances. Okay, great. Um, I'm actually gonna move to the Q and A because we have four great questions and some of them um, like, you know, maybe even say some of the things I want to say even better than I do. So, and we can jump back to, to my own questions. But again, if you have any more questions, please put them in. We'll try to move through as many as possible. But our first question comes from Barbara, and I think actually sort of um, builds a little bit or, you know, is a, a another question about, um, you know, sort of indigenous resistance, which is in what ways can corporations be more responsible to indigenous communities when mining lithium and copper? Um, and I, I mean, I'm uh, I am also interested in this question as it involves the state too. Um, so uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for giving me the beginning of my answer because that's where I was going to begin. You know, I think that um, I'm all for better governance of mining sectors, uh, you know, at the same time that I think it's equally important to reduce how much mining is needed, right? And I, I see those as complementary. Um, and, and I know that th this is not what the question asker is asking, and I promise I will answer it, but I just want to kind of suggest this framing, which is that, you know, I think a lot can be done with better regulation, with better governance, with, um, you know, respect for rights, and I'll come to more of that in a moment, like in extractive landscapes to make extraction less harmful or to, in some cases, preclude it, where maybe it just does not fit with community needs or the landscape um, itself. Um, but I want to just emphasize that I think that you know, a lot of what makes extraction um, an industry that is is so harmful and also so kind of like territorially expansive is that 
there's such a demand for those materials coming from downstream in the supply chain, right? Like the demand for lithium basically all comes from passenger vehicles, right? And so that, that suggests that like one way to make lithium less harmful is to sort of do less of it if possible. Um, but that probably can't happen just by changes in how those landscapes are governed. It needs to happen with decisions further down the supply chain. Um, and so just kind of want to keep those two different pieces together. But, you know, now more to the question. Um, yeah, I think that I would not personally, and I'm not suggesting uh, Barbara is is saying this, but just to kind of uh, dramatize it a little bit, I would not personally rely on corporations on their own initiative to do anything that will dramatically improve the situation of indigenous communities or biodiversity or water use. Um, we know that these corporations are answerable to their shareholders. We know they're subject to fiduciary obligations that require them to maximize the value of their shares, right? And that's how they operate, right? Now, of course, every single company has a part of its website that says corporate social responsibility or explains how they're reducing their water use or working with local indigenous communities. Um, um, but I think that the most effective way, aside from like demand reduction, which I was emphasizing, but the most effective way to, re to um, reduce the harms of mining is to bring the state back in, right? You know, a lot of what we see in resource frontiers is this kind of present absence of the state. Like the state is present in the sense that often resource sectors are directly regulated by the state. The state might have some legal role or ownership capacity over the resources. This you know, depends on the country. Um, that those resource sectors might be considered strategic. In Chile, the, the lithium sector is classified as strategic. Of course, in many oil and gas and coal producing regions of the world, those, those resources are classified by the state of, as strategic. Um, and so the state has this role as an owner or as designating them as like particularly important, but the state is often absent in other ways, meaning like the state is not really there as like a welfare provider or a rights enforcer or an infrastructure builder. And so these are like often vast kind of rural peripheries or hinterlands. And honestly, Nevada and Chile and parts of Portugal look similar in this respect. Um, that that don't have a lot in the way of social services or good infrastructure, where the state in its more, again, like social welfare functions is not very present. And so what ends up happening in those situations is kind of twofold. One is people are more economically desperate. So they're more willing in some cases to like accept a mining project, even if it's not their favorite idea of an economic activity, like there may not be a lot of economic opportunity. So that can kind of like sway how people, um, you know, that can sometimes dampen resistance in some cases when when people are working are living in situations where there's not a lot of job prospects. Um, but the other, and this gets a little more to the question, is that we see corporations like filling in for the state, right? Which is also a very complex and and I think suboptimal uh, uh, outcome, um, where we see corporations kind of offering certain benefits, like we'll build a soccer field, is like the classic one, right? Or whatever it is, which. And, and that only kind of works because the state is not there doing those things and people come to rely on the corporation, um, which then I think can let companies get away with forms of harm and exploitation because they're like providing services or jobs. Um, and, you know, so, you know, just to underscore, I think that the best way to improve environmental, social, labor, and safety outcomes, which are, I think, the four things we're most concerned about with mining, is to strengthen the administrative capacities of the state, is to enforce binding regulations, is to codify human rights, indigenous rights, and labor rights in ways that, again, are enforceable. And mining companies always lobby against that, which is always a clue that they're probably a good idea, right? Uh, like we should, you know, if, if, if something is uh, very acceptable to the mining industry, probably it's not a very muscular regulation, right? And so oftentimes companies push back against these regulations, but I think they're very important uh, to lift up standards um, and ensure that at least the worst outcomes, you know, in terms of like uh, some of the really big safety hazards that mines pose with the piles of physical waste and things like that, like to at least prevent some of the worst um, outcomes and to also make sure that civil society, including indigenous communities, is fully kind of empowered and knows their rights and is able to claim um, and makes claims against mining companies when abuses happen. 
Okay, great. Um, the next question comes from Rebecca, um, who writes, in his recent Mother Jones article, Yes in Our Backyards, Bill McKibben refers to a conversation he had with you. How would you describe the similarities and differences in how you two see energy transformation, the en energy transformation we need? Also, how would you respond to his comment that slowing down lithium mining likely means extending the years we keep mining coal? Yeah, um, that's that is a great question and, and good close read of that of that article. Uh, and we did talk for a while before he wrote it, and on and which is and so they're unquoted there. And also, I know that he closely read the report that I mentioned earlier and kind of referenced it in, in the piece. Um, you know, I I think that the way to describe it, and I think he'd agree with me because I said something more or less like this. I don't want to, uh, you know, he's definitely an extremely important climate activist, and I and I'm not going to criticize him on that count. Though I do think we have, you know, obviously some disagreements that he he or maybe different perspectives is a better way to put it that he references in the piece. But you know, I think where folks like Bill McKibben are coming from is many years of battles with the fossil fuel industry, understandably. And that's an ongoing battle because the fossil fuel industry is still alive and well. It's still extremely profitable. Uh, there's still many fossil fuel subsidies making, you know, making it even more profitable. Um, and we're still all driving around mainly in gas guzzlers, right? So I'm not trying to say that fossil fuels are over and all we need to think about are the challenges of renewable energy. Um, and, you know, so I think it's fair and understandable that someone with like a long career of activism and advocacy against the fossil fuel enemy is like worried that anyone like me in this case, kind of nuancing or complicating renewable energy a bit, um, as I remain like a fierce advocate of renewable energy, like I'm not against it, but I am calling attention to some of the supply chain harms. And I am calling attention to the fact that there are better and worse ways to design these renewable energy uh, powered sectors, right? Um, but, you know, I think Bill's concern, and I've heard this from other folks, um, uh, you know, that, that have been in the fight for a long time, that if we kind of take our eye off the prize of fighting the fossil fuel industry, and get like too kind of nuanced and complicated about what we say about renewable energy, like we're actually doing the fossil fuel industries work for them, right? Like wouldn't the fossil fuel industry love for us to point out problems with renewable energy so that they can capitalize on that or instrumentalize it to kind of convince politicians or ordinary voters that we need to stick with fossil fuels, you know, which of course is an absurd statement on on you know if if and when fossil fuel companies do kind of say something like that it's of course absurd because as you mentioned Miranda like extractivism is also at the base of the fossil fuel industry right fossil fuels are not only bad because when they're combusted they cause climate change that's like the main reason that they're bad but secondarily and pretty importantly they cause lots of localized harm in the places that they're extracted right and so you know i my sort of critique of extractivism again inspired by folks in latin america that i mentioned at the beginning of the call um or beginning of this event um is broad like i i i'm not at all trying to let fossil fuel industry off the hook but i think you know again to be gen generous to bill that he's worried that if you know someone like me says we shouldn't view EVs as the only panacea. We should think about electric mass transit and walking and cycling. He's like, you're 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 maybe making the fossil fuel industries point for them in some way, or maybe that you're like dampening enthusiasm for renewable energy. And I I, I hear that, but I think that you know the more that we can emphasize that these goals work together, which is what I tried to say to him. Maybe he didn't fully buy it, uh, you know, based on the article and that quote. But you know, as I said before, like it's much faster to address climate change if we also do some system change, which I'm totally aware has political impediments, but they aren't, um, they, they're, they're not like, they're not fortresses. Like we can actually move some of these politics. I'll just note that yesterday, the New York State House um, uh, did a bunch of amazing things regarding climate, but specific to our call today, our, our meeting today, like they just passed a big budget increase for the MTA, the transit authority, which has been in like a death spiral of losing money. So there are, you know, that's happening. We see generation Z, the generation below me, um, really not into car ownership and really saying in surveys that they want transit and walkability, right? Um, you know, we see lots of interesting experiments at the municipal level and soon at the state level in the U.S. of subsidizing e-bikes, which are great because they require much less lithium and they're great at getting people around, um, especially, you know, within a denser context. So, you know, there are interesting solutions out there. Um, but, you know, again, what I tried to say to Bill is that the faster we can 
um, the, the more that we can rethink our transportation system, it's better for the climate goals that he and I both share and also for limiting extractivism. Um, but maybe didn't fully convince him, but I was glad that he gave it so much thought. I think that that was probably by his own admission, like the most that he had thought about some of these supply chain implications. So, you know, the more dialogue on this, the better. Um, great. Okay. So our next um, question is from Greg, who asks, um, do you know how much degrowth policies might affect the need for lithium mining? I'm thinking especially of Jason Hickel's book, Less is More, but any material on degrowth will probably be in the same vein. Thanks. Yeah, this is a great question. I mean, you know, degrowth is a uh, sort of a kind of political ecological vision, just for folks that aren't aware of it, because the term is a bit more known in Europe than it is in the US. And it's particularly uh, uh, kind of a movement in France and a couple of other European countries. But anyway, degrowth is the idea that, you know, the root of capitalism's harms is like the kind of growth machine, the fact that like, we need to grow GDP, grow production, grow consumption, and that this clashes with planetary boundaries. Um, and the fact that there are biophysical limits to all of our natural systems, and we cannot have endless growth on a finite planet. I think that I think that's more or less a, a, a way to think about degrowth. And then, you know, that raises a host of, of questions of like, you know, is degrowth about limiting everyone's consumption? You know, I think that's a rather crude form of it that most, um, I think, smarter degrowth advocates do not endorse. They more are thinking about the inequalities of consumption. So the fact that like global, really rich people in the global north are like over consumers and their footprint in terms of resource use and carbon footprint, material use is really, really like disproportionate, right? And so, you know, we can kind of weave in like an uh, analysis of inequality of consumption into how we think about degrowth. Um, but, you know, another way to think about degrowth is that, um, you know, is to kind of think of ways to like collectively and socially provide through the public sector, like what we need to, to live and to thrive rather than the system that we have now, which is like individualized, privatized and very unequal consumption. And that's very clear in the transportation sector, which is actually a very class unequal sector. We don't always think about that, but, you know, cause it kind of depends what your own class background is, but you know, it's very unusual to have the privilege to fly. Like most people in the world, like never fly, like most Americans never fly, right? Like, or, or do so extremely rarely. And there's a kind of, you know, this is someone else's term, but there's a kinetic elite, like a sort of ultra mobile elite that can get on a jet plane or get into their, you know, fancy car or whatever it is, um, where many people are relegated to not having good transportation options or for the option they do have, which is a car to be very burdensome to them. And it also turns out, as our report kind of shows, that 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 as we electrify that very unequal, individualized form of, of consumption, of mobility, also is very resource intensive, right? So from a degrowth perspective, that's a problem. And so, you know, I guess a different way to put it is that I view our report as complementary to degrowth um, in the sense that it shows that we... Uh, like can in a way do more with less, right? That if we actually rethink how we structure our system and focus more on what's called collective consumption, meaning, you know, collectively consuming the transportation of a bus rather than individually as cars, right? That we actually can have forms of public affluence and, and luxury and really high quality services without the same kind of resource footprint as in the more kind of privatized and individualized model. So it's a partial answer to your question, Greg, but, but, uh, but I think it 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 kind of maybe shows the complementarities. Okay, great. Um, this kind of takes us back to some of the questions I had prepared on resistances and 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 uh, and, and sort of the politics of anti-extraction um, in Latin America. So um, this is from Nico. I'm wondering if you can discuss lithium extraction relation to the shape of the pink tie that is taken um, taken in Bolivia and the movimiento al socialismo. Um, I understand or MAS. Um, my understanding is that the U.S. supported the 2019 coup against Evo Morales. Uh, turned largely, though, not only on Moss's attempt to nationalize the lithium industry. Um, how does the Bolivian situation figure into your book project? And are there any similarities in Ecuador in terms of divisions among the left on the question of lithium extraction? And I will just jump in and say that I think um, maybe my introduction and also Professor Rio Francos is very um, prolific. But just to clarify, the resource radicals focuses on 
oil and mining in Ecuador, and your newer work focuses on lithium in Chile. So maybe you could speak to one or both. Sure. Sure. And, and um, also um, in, um, in, and the new book also kind of goes afield of Chile and in Nevada and Portugal, but is, but, but a lot of the research was in Chile. And, and so, yeah, no, I mean, this is a really interesting question that honestly, we could have a whole event on because the, because Nico is bringing up a lot of different points. I mean, I, uh, I'm almost not sure where to begin because there's a lot in here, but let me just start with, with the coup quickly. Um, You know, I, I am, I am uh, in agreement with calling what happened in 2019 a coup. I mean, basically, the military asked asked Evo Morales, the then president, to step down. And so, you know, I do think you had a military kind of intervention into civilian politics, and that that fits my definition. I know there's a whole kind of scholar controversy over whether to call it a coup or not for various reasons, right? But but just because just noting the use of that term. You know, where I would differ a little bit is that I don't actually think the coup was caused by lithium nationalization. I mean, one is that the timing doesn't really make sense because lithium had been nationalized a long time prior twenty the 2019 coup. Um, but also like the way that kind of the, the events that 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 um directly preceded the coup is that uh Morales had actually the Morales government had signed a contract with a German company to help develop the Bolivian lithium sector, right? And so though even though the the lithium sector is nationalized in in Bolivia, which it is, um, they do partner with or are trying to partner with. It kind of hasn't quite gotten off the ground. But anyway, the idea is to partner in joint ventures with um, foreign companies that can do some technology transfer so that the Bolivian state-owned company can, can become more expert in, in, in the lithium supply chain and then maybe take it over themselves, right? But they had signed, the Morales government um, had signed a contract with this German firm and there, it was very celebrated, like in Germany and Bolivia, everyone seemed very happy about it, except who was not happy about it was the people that live in Potosi, which is the region or the department technically, which is the name for provinces in, in Bolivia, where lithium is, is, where the lithium deposits are. And Potosi might ring a bell, depending on your knowledge of like imperial Spanish history, because that was where some of the main silver mines that fed the Spanish empire. So the silver mines of Potosi is a kind of storied, you know, like it, it just like a, a very resonant association um, for its role. And in, in again, like imperialism, but also for the exploitation and harm that that whole process left behind. And so, you know, there's lots of different feelings among local people in Potosi about mining. They're not per se all environmentalist or against mining. A lot of the issues actually that folks had were that they felt the contract didn't distribute enough benefits locally or to Bolivia versus to the German company. And so, there was a lot of protest in Potosi about this contract and Morales uh, canceled the contract. He did not want to cancel it. He had signed it, um, but he responded to that local discontent and he said, OK, I'll nullify the executive order that like established this contract. Um, and then, you know, not long after the coup happened, but but again, like the coup wasn't a response to nationalization that had already occurred, nor was it nor was the lithium conflict that connected. Um, you know, I think the coup was much more, in my view, about um, uh, uh, the kind of domestic class conflict and political conflict in Bolivia between elites and mass. And also we could maybe say some errors that Evo Morales made himself, um, which I won't get into too much right now. But, um, but that's all to say that, you know, lithium is nationalized in Bolivia, right? That's still the case. And actually what's important to also know for folks not knowledgeable about Bolivia is that the mass, the Socialist Party is back in power and they continue with their plans to develop their nationalized lithium sector. So though there was this kind of unfortunate interregnum of a coup and like a right-wing government uh, that was short-lived, we have the MAS back in power right now. Um, and I wanna flag that this is like a global and regional trend really, like of nationalizing lithium and of also more state involvement in these mineral sectors that are linked to the energy transition. So Mexico also, the Mexican government, the AMLO government nationalized lithium, um, Chile's president, um, Boric, uh, just a few days ago announced that he wants to nationalize lithium and is proposing something to Congress. Um, lith uh, sorry, Argentina, Chile, Bolivia, and Mexico, and I think maybe Brazil have been involved in these kind of Latin America regional coordination of the lithium sector talks, which are interesting. And some people call like lithium OPEC that might overstate it a little bit. You know, meanwhile, just to give a totally different example, 
Indonesia uh, has has Im implemented some resource nationalist policies in its nickel sector, which is another battery metal. So there's a lot of resource nationalism. Let me put it that way. And you know there have been waves of this historically, right? We could go back to the 1930s. We could go back to the original pink tie that I think someone else has asked, or maybe this isn't the same question uh, asking about. Um, and you know I think that it. It's it's a there's been a kind of historic demand on the part of people that live in places where resources are extracted that they should at the very least have more of the economic benefit and control right vis a vis multinational corporations so that's a kind of periodic demand that surfaces in mining and oil and other kind of commodity dependent um, countries. Um, you know, I think what what we want to do, though, is maybe may, and and you know our time doesn't fully allow for it right now, but kind of get into the weeds of like what are the actual nationalization policies? Like, do they or do they not kind of tilt the balance of power between the, the government of Bolivia or Chile or wherever it is and the multinational company? You know, one thing to note is that nationalization these days doesn't tend to preclude foreign capital or multinational contracts with multinationals. As I just said, even in the case of Bolivia, which has like probably one of the more kind of strident resource nationalist policies around lithium um, that that has happened alongside negotiations with foreign companies around kind of sectoral development. So, you know, I think sometimes nationalization can sound in a way more radical than it is, or we think of these older forms of nationalization that were actually expropriation where these days it tends to mean like establish a state-owned company and uh, and and set up a joint venture between that company and a foreign and a foreign multinational, um, and that can be beneficial on the economic front, putting aside environmental issues about around extraction. But that can you know kind of again balance the power a bit, make the revenue distribution between the company and the government more fair. It can, under ideal circumstances, result in some technology transfer and and upgrading of, of the value chain, um, but. But a lot of that is like, you know, they say the devil is in the details, like the exact policies, the forms of leverage. Um, and um, and to this day, Bolivia doesn't have like a really developed lithium sector. And I would not personally attribute that to the resource nationalism. I think there's kind of other reasons for it. But um, but, you know, I guess I guess what I'm saying is that the future is slightly uncertain for the sector in Bolivia, but we do see neighboring countries kind of making similar moves. And and I'm, I'm very curious to see how that plays out. OK, great. Unfortunately, we are at time and um, Professor Ria Francos has to go. There are some very great questions still left, so we'll, we'll have to have you back um, to talk more. Um, but anything that you want to close with? Um, thank you so much much for joining us. This was such an interesting conversation. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, it's a shame because our two last questions are awesome from Omar and, and Blanca about, you know, the specter of China and also what does international solidarity look like in practice. So hopefully there'll be another opportunity to talk about those more. Um, but I just really thank you for these wonderful questions and such an engaged audience. So thank you so much. Great. Anyway, thank you all for being here.